life and sea troubles to continue in faith. There is a part of us that doubts when troubles come. And the title of my message today is Such an Unfair World. And to be honest with you, I know very few people who've lived very long at all who have not at some point in their life gone, you know, life's not fair. It's just not fair. Things are not the way it should be. I should not have to deal with what I'm dealing with. And I think it's one of those things that it's exasperated by the fact that when you look around, you see truly evil people prospering. You will see people who do not respect God. And they seem to be living a life that is free of any pain, of any sorrow. And the truth of it is, it leads us to ask, why is life so unfair? And the brutal honesty is, life is not fair. The truth of it is, life will never be fair. That's a reality that is not one I want to accept. But it's a reality I must accept because it's an honest thing that we have to realize. There's an old joke that fair is only something that happens in August in Des Moines. And the truth of it is, we should learn to quit expecting to be treated fair. And we should stop feeling like somehow because God loves us, that that exempts us from problems and dealing with issues in our lives. There's probably no better example in the Bible of a man who was treated unjustly, unfairly, than the guy named Job. You're all familiar with Job. And we're going to spend a little bit of time in Job today because Job has basically a life that is not fair. And in Job 21, verses 7 through 18, Job is making that same point. Why do the wicked live, reach old age, and grow mighty in power? Their offspring are established in their presence, and their descendants before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, and no rod of God is upon them. Their bulls breed without fail, their cows calve and do not miscarry. And no rod, and they send out their little boys in like a flock, and their children dance. They sing to the tambourine and the lyre, and rejoice at the sound of the pipe. They spend their days in prosperity and in peace, and they go down to Sheol. They say to God, Depart from us. We do not desire to know the knowledge of your ways. What is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit do we get if we pray to him? Behold, is not the prosperity of their land? The counsel of the wicked is far from me. How often is it the lamp of the wicked is put out, and that their calamity comes upon them? that God distributes pain in his anger, that they are like straw before the wind and like chaff and the storm carries away. Now, what Job is saying here is he's having troubles. He's had his whole family wiped out. His crops are ruined. His livestock are taken away. He has become unhealthy and he's covered with sores. So he's far from being what I call a whiny individual here. He has spent all of his life being a godly man, doing the right things, and in a few days saw everything that he had within the world taken away from him. And I guess looking at it from Job's perspective, I'm not surprised he's questioning and to be real honest with you, when he sees evil men who reject God doing quite well, there's got to be a part of you that says, wait a minute, Lord, this isn't fair. They're evil. They deserve to be punished, but they're not. I deserve to be rewarded, but I'm not. I'm being punished. And I think one of the problems with what Job is going through is, it causes you to question God and his fairness. And that's no accident, my friends. Job suffered because 
Satan challenged God and said, he will reject you if you give him hard times. When you and I go through hard times, make no mistake, Satan is a part of that. Satan desires to create as much trouble for you and he will make for the Christian a hard life. The reality is there's too many folks today that will try to tell you that become a Christian and everything will go well. You will get rich. You'll get healthy. You'll get everything will go your way if you're a good Christian. And yet, that is not biblical. And it certainly isn't accurate. What it means is, if you're having a great time, Satan is not trying to attack you. And if Satan is not trying to attack you, it's because... You're in his team, not the other team. So consider the fact that if you have trouble-free life, you might be serving the wrong king. And I think one of those things that we have to come to reality is that as a Christian, life will be hard. It will be a struggle. Jesus warned that in this world you will have tribulation. But don't worry, I've overcome the world. Moving down to Psalm 73, 1 through 17, we see another man, Asaph, questioning God. He says, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure of heart. But as for me, my heart, or my feet almost stumbled, my steps almost slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death, their bodies are fat and sleek, they are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride in their necklace, violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes swell out through their fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten an oppression. They set their mouths against heaven, and their tongues strut through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, those are the wicked are always at ease. Their increase in riches. All in vain I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands of innocence. For all day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generations of your children. But when I thought of how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Asaph is credited for about 12 of the Psalms. And what he's referring to here is what I call sin envy. The wicked seem to live a charmed and easy life. They seem to get away with murder, as the old saying goes. They seem to have no troubles, while the righteous seem to have no end of troubles. And again, at first glance, that seems quite unfair. And it seems like an injustice so great that Asaph says he almost stumbled because of it. And I will suggest to you that that is something that you and I can also stumble in. If we start becoming envious of the wicked, if we start saying, you know, I've been a Christian for so long and God still hasn't given me all the blessings that my neighbor has, and my neighbor is an evil man, why am I following God? It's a question that we must as Christians face because the reality is the wicked do thrive in this world. And it says Asaph did not find a satisfactory answer until he entered the sanctuary of God and discerned the end of the wicked. My friends, there is a sense that God does not have justice when we look at the wicked thriving. And that's because we look at it from man's point of view. If I get caught speeding, a deputy sheriff will pull me over immediately and write me a ticket. And we look at that and we call that justice. Fair enough. 
But when we as Christians look at the world and we see evil men doing evil things and they don't get reprimanded immediately, we somehow believe that they are not getting justice. They are not getting the punishment they deserve. And you know, that sin envy can cause us some real misconceptions about God. One is that, well, God must condone that, okay. They're getting away with it, so God must be okay with that because he hasn't punished them for that. That's a misconception, I hate to tell you, but trust me, the Bible is very clear. The penalty for sin is death. There is no way around that. And when I have to look at what's going on with the wicked and the righteous, to understand it from a godly perspective, I have to view it from God's perspective. As I said, the penalty for sin is death, eternity in hell. Now, I'm all for the evil people who do the evil things having that end because they deserve it. In fact, I think they should get there quicker sometimes because they do so much evil. But where I'm failing to understand it from God's perspective is that I too fall in the category of that evil person. The reason God gives us so much time to practice evil is because God desires us to repent. God desires us to say, I have done wrong and I don't want to do it anymore. Do not mistake God's patience for condoning sin. Nothing could be more incorrect. Because God desires us to repent, he gives us as long as possible. But make no mistake, judgment will come and there will be a hell for the wicked. As Asaph says, their end is quite seriously a bad place. Now that means that while you and I live this world of trouble and we see these evil people going on and we don't get to see their just desserts, we start to feel like it's unfair. And like I said, it is not unfair. In fact, it's the fairest thing in the world. God has delayed judgment so all who will can receive forgiveness of their sins. The fact of the matter is that if God put a time frame on it, very many of us would have failed the time frame. The fact that I see people who've lived 30, 40, 50, 60 years of their life in sin and then repented. If God had put a repentance time limit on it, those people may have failed. They may not have gotten to repent and receive salvation. We do not want a time limit on forgiveness. Because my friends, as I've shared with you before, and as you all well very much know from your own personal life, you are not free of sin. I am not free of sin. This very day, we are going to come before God and say, Lord, I kind of blew it again today. I had feelings and I had emotions. I had thoughts that I shouldn't have had. And Lord, please forgive me for those. God's patience with the wicked is not a condoning of his sin. It is not an injustice. It is merely his saying, I want to give them as much opportunity to be saved as they can. Knowing quite well that many will refuse it even so. And Job struggled with this quite a bit. In fact, if you read the book of Job, and it's a depressing book, you see Job doing a lot of complaining and his friends doing a lot of analyzing and saying, well, you know, God, you must have done something wrong because if you're suffering, 
then frankly, it's because God's punishing you. And Job's point is, no, the people doing stuff wrong are not being punished, they're being rewarded. But Job comes to a point in verse 38, where after his griping and moaning and complaining, after his taking and saying, God, you're an unjust God, you're not fair, God decided to answer him. And we move down to Job 38, 1 through 7. And the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man, and I will question you, and you will make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determines its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretches the line in it? And where is its base is sunk? At what laid its cornerstone? And when the morning stars sang together, all the sons of God shouted for joy. God takes the entire chapter of 38 and 39 of Job to rebuke Job. Now, I'm here to tell you, when you get two chapters worth of rebuke, you get humble pretty quick. And Job did get humble pretty quick. In fact, Job finally says, I spoke without thinking. And that's probably the hardest thing about being a Christian. Is that one statement that you've all heard, but part of you doesn't want to accept. And that is, God is God and you're not. There's a part of me that thinks I'm pretty smart. There's a part of me that thinks I understand pretty well. And there's a part of me that says, this should make sense to me. And what God is saying is, you have no way of even understanding the basic principles of my ways. And for a Christian, one of the first things I have to acknowledge is that I am not God. And that things will not make sense. And certainly, life will not seem fair. But I am here to tell you that make no mistake about it, justice does come. John 3.16 tells me that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him would be delivered. You and I are invited by God to be saved, to be forgiven. Now, there are many people who will not accept that. And those people, sadly, will go to hell. I'm reminded of David Jeremiah, who is a, he's actually Dr. David Jeremiah. He's a radio pastor. He's preached millions of sermons. But when he was a young man starting out, he had a uh, teacher who came to watch him preach. And he was a bit nervous, and he was a little worried about what the doctor was going to say about his preaching as a young man. And after he was finished, the young man went, or Dr. David Meyer went up to the teacher and says, well, what did I do, or how did I do? And the man says, you, you're fundamentally correct in all your biblical aspects and everything else. But he says, one thing I do have a problem with. When you tell people they're going to hell, you should not appear to look like you enjoy that idea. And I think there is something to be said for that. You know, I want to see the wicked punished. But I have enough understanding of hell and how terrible it is to tell you that there is no one in the world I desire to see there. No one is so terrible that they should end up for an eternity in hell. And that's God's desire. Now the reality is, sadly, there will be Many who choose hell over heaven. And it is going to be a time where in this world, you're going to see unfairness. You as a Christian may suffer. You may have health problems. You may have money problems. You may have all sorts of problems. And you look next door to the wicked and you go, there's nothing wrong with them. They thrive. They do well. God is not delaying their judgment because he's unjust or unfair. He's delaying that judgment 
because he desires them to turn to him. Now, I will tell you that there will be a day of justice. And that justice will come at a day where there will be no turning back. And as I've said, you can think of the person who you hate the most, who's been the most terrible person in the world. And I can think of several candidates that would make good examples, Adolf Hitler being one of them. And the terrible things he did. Does that man deserve hell? Almost certainly. However, God wanted to give him forgiveness if he would have taken it. I do not look at the sin of the world with an envious eye. I do not look at the wicked who thrive and say, well, why? Because unfortunately, they're living in Satan's world. And I'll be honest with you, if you're a Christian living in Satan's world, you should expect trouble. You should expect there will be problems. Because this is his world. And he is going to put as much difficulty on you in the same way that he did with Job. Satan challenged God and says, if you just but take away his wealth, he'll curse you. And so Satan was allowed to take away his wealth. And then it was, if you take away his family, he'll curse you. Satan was allowed to take away his family. It was then his own health that was taken away. And Job refused to reject God. My friends, you live in a world where Satan wants to separate you from God. You will live in an unfair world. You will face unfair things in your life. You will face hard times that the wicked do not. That is not a sign that God is weak or he is not caring. God's point is to let all come to redemption. When I look at it through God's eyes, as Asaph did, and I realize that the wicked will one day pay for their sins, <clears throat> I have a special thing about child abuse because I grew up with it. And I've always had this thing about wanting to see child abusers punished a little harder. And Matthew shares what they said was going to happen. And it said, Jesus spoke and says, it'd be better for you to have a millstone tied to your neck and thrown into the sea than to be one of those people facing justice. There will be a day where that will be a fact. The wicked will, in fact, be punished if they do not repent. And I should not glory on that. I should not look forward to that. What I should do is say, thank God, because as much as I judge other sins, God tells me my sin is just as terrible as theirs. Jesus was made a real good point to saying, you know, it says you should not murder. But if you say someone's a fool, you're guilty of hell. Now, my friends, I've shared with my Bible study group. I can't tell you how many times I've called someone a fool. But it's more than I care to admit. And I'm here to tell you that puts me in judgment. I am thrilled that God is not going to hold that judgment against me if I repent. I desire for all people to know the love of God and to repent. And that, my friends, when I look at it from God's perspective, changes my view on fairness completely. Because when I look at it from Godless view, God desires all people to forget, be forgiven. He desires all to repent. They won't, but that's his desire. And he's going to give them time to do that. I worship God because he died for me. I was one of the wicked, and so were you. 
He suffered and paid the cost of my sin debt because I was willing to accept that free gift. And I'll be honest with you, that if you really want to get down to the earth of what's fair and what's not fair, the fact that Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, who was perfect, who was God himself, it was not fair that he should come to earth and suffer and die because of what I do, because of what you do. If I want to get to the truth of what is fair and what is not, Christ's death was not a fair account. He suffered and died for things he did not do. He suffered and died for things I did, for things you did. So in the world of unfairness, maybe I should desire less fairness and thank God that he created the world the way he did and that he's willing to be tolerant to let us repent so that we can, in fact, accept that free gift that he has given us. I thank God that my idea of fairness is not God's because I'm afraid I probably would have gone over the allowances. You know, when Peter asked Jesus, how many times do I forgive my brother? Seven times? You know, think about that. How many times should God forgive me for sinning? Seven times? If any of you are more than five weeks old, I'm going to guess you'd already used up all seven of those forgivenesses. I thank God that he does not consider fairness in the same way man does. God loves us enough to die for us. He is fair enough to allow even the worst of wicked the opportunity to repent. Make no mistake, if they do not, hell is their future. And hell is every bit as terrible as you've heard. And make no mistake, it is real. There are people in the church trying to tell you today that hell does not exist. And my friends, it is a real place where a vast majority of people will end up. I thank God that God does not go by my signs of fairness, but by his own. Let us repent and turn to him and pray for those who are wicked so that they might receive forgiveness also and not have to go to hell. Thank you.